Good morning, everybody. I am Jody Brown. I'm the executive director for the Parkinson Association of the Rockies. Bear with me. I know Elena Kessler normally does these, and she's having some internet problems, so I am taking over. So Dr. Wilder and myself are, are going to try to navigate this webinar. Um, I just want to welcome everybody to the webinar. And the topic of today is reducing inflammation and promoting health with light therapy. I'm gonna have Dr. Wilder introduce herself in just a bit, but I first wanna talk about a couple of notes. Um, the first one is that we are gonna hold questions until the end of the presentation. At that point, um, we'll both come back on the screen and I will ask questions and Dr. Wilder can answer those. This presentation will be recorded and it will be sent out to everyone who has registered at, um, once we get it up and running, which will probably be uh, tomorrow or first thing Monday. And there are handouts, or there, I'm sorry, there are no handouts for this presentation, um, but there will be a webinar survey after the presentation that will come in a follow-up email to you. I also wanna let you know about upcoming webinars. Um, you can register on our website. The correct link is up above there. We have an understanding neuropsychology testing coming up on Monday. That's gonna be a really good program about what it takes to do the neurophysiological testing before DBS. We have our third episode of Parkinson's 101 on exercise on Tuesday, June 15th. What are my options when PD medications aren't enough will be on Wednesday, June 23rd. And then we have a hallucinations and delusions presentation on Wednesday, July 7th. So there's a lot going on. Please go to our website or call our office to find out what we are doing. And with that, I am going to introduce you to Dr. Wilder and give me a moment because I'm going to make her the presenter here and she can share her screen. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, let's see. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, you can see the presentation? Yes. Okay, let me get there myself. Okay, all right, so welcome everyone. Thank you again so much for having me, I really appreciate it. And so my name is Dr. Emma Wilder, and I'm here to discuss and chat with you all about reducing inflammation and promoting health with light therapy and really looking at Parkinson's disease from a functional medicine perspective. So a quick disclaimer here, everything I'm presenting is really intended for educational purposes only, and I'm not making any specific medical advice for anybody individually or collectively. I also am going to be talking a lot about light therapy or photobiomodulation therapy. And as of the date of this presentation, that is not an FDA approved use for the laser, but I will be presenting research that has been done as well as clinical experience using laser in that capacity. So quick overview of where we're going today. Just give you a very brief introduction of myself. And then we're gonna really dive into class for a laser, what it is, how it works, and get that really good foundation so that we can then apply it to how it applies to Parkinson's disease. I wanna touch briefly on the research and understanding of Parkinson's disease as a systemic disease. I'm gonna call at PD for short throughout the remainder of the presentation. And then we're gonna round it out with how understanding the systemic approach and using therapies in addition to light therapy have been really shown to be effective, both again, studies and clinically. And we'll have some time at the end for questions. Let's get going. So very brief introduction. I am an ND or a naturopathic doctor. And I think that might be a new concept for many people. So when I say naturopathic doctor, I'm referring to someone who's attended a four year accredited naturopathic medical school and has passed subsequent board licensing exams. So this is not someone who took a weekend course and is calling themselves a naturopath or something like that. And the scope of practice really changes depending on which state. So in the state of Colorado, as an example, I have very limited restrictions in how I can use, uh, you know, prescribed drugs and prescription medications. Where I was trained up in Washington State, uh, for example, I did have a full scope of prescriptive rights. So it just depends on the state how naturopathic doctors practice. I do have a practice down in Denver, and I really focus on understanding and investigating and then treating the root cause of disease. 
as well as really promoting health and vitality. My Parkinson's Disease Foundations, I, in addition to you know, standard curriculum and standard clinical training, I also did a PD intensive school with Dr. Lori Mishley. Some of you may be familiar with her. She has received several NIH grants to investigate, for example, glutathione use in Parkinson's disease, et cetera. So she's, I studied with her and up at Bastyr University in Washington State, which is where I went to naturopathic medical school, she held, holds a Parkinson's disease school. So she has people fly from across the country and, and the world, and they stay for an intensive training in all all things Parkinson's disease, functional approaches predominantly, but it's a it's an intensive. It lasts every day, goes on for uh, six or seven days the whole week, and that was an enormous eye opener to all of the different facets of treatment and and a lot of things that aren't commonly talked about. So that was really informative and, and helped inspire me a lot to want to work with people with PD. And then I also had extensive clinical training using class four laser in general and with um, people with PD. And so some of the results that I'm sharing will be based on clinical trials, but also uh, clinical experience for myself and other professionals. So let's get into it. Let's dive into class four laser. When I talk about class four laser, I put a few other terms there like photobiomodulation therapy, high intensity laser therapy, and deep tissue laser therapy. It can go by several different names, but the class four laser is really important because there are other classes. So we'll talk about the mechanics here. Some of this will get a little bit into the terminology here for those of you interested great and for those of you it's a little much don't worry in a couple of slides we're going to get into that kind of clinical results but i do want to really understand how this is working and why it is effective so laser is an emission of energy and it's in the form of photons or light we have a couple different wavelengths that it can be in for this specific laser the class 4 that i use and other people have used as well it's 810 and 980 nanometers which is in the near infrared spectrum this is an optimal wavelength to deliver the energy to cells and really target mitochondria and a few other structures that we'll talk about and it also minimizes interference from all the tissue that stands between the laser and the area that we're trying to treat so for example in the picture we're trying to treat an arthritic knee and we need to be able to get through the layers of skin which has a lot of water melanin etc each treatment is going to be unique to the individual and to the area and how much tissue there is and What's fantastic about laser is that it's non-invasive, where we're, the light itself is doing the penetration, but we're not having to put anything, you know, we're not putting injections or other machines within the body itself. So here's an example of what the machine looks like. We have a few different parameters we adjust. We're adjusting time of treatment, power in watts, and the watts we're delivering per second is how we get the total energy delivered in the bottom right-hand corner there and the joules. We also are doing a continuous wavelength. There are different types of wavelengths we can use. And then we're adjusting, we use a Fitzpatrick scale to adjust for different types of skin pigmentation. And also there are some people who are very sensitive to light, for example. Um, so all of these parameters are really what makes a class four laser the high intensity or high class that it is. Classes of laser that you can also use on humans are classes one through three, and those are considered cold lasers. You don't actually feel the laser itself. This laser uh, that I'm speaking about, the class four, you do feel heat from the laser. It's emitting at that high of an energy output or joules. And this really matters. Here's just a brief clinical trial. We don't need to go into it too much, but wanted to just demonstrate that for in this clinical trial are treating plantar fasciitis, which is inflammation in the bottom of your foot predominantly. And both low level laser and this high level laser I'm talking about were effective. However, high level laser drastically improved pain levels, function and quality of life in a more significant way than the low laser. And it will occur much more quickly because in each given session, you can deliver a lot more energy. And this becomes even more important when we're diving into deeper structures. The foot is very, fairly superficial or close to the surface. And so again, as we go to deeper structures, it matters more to have that higher intensity. All right, so we are diving in 
to how this is going to work in the body. Again, a little bit of science here, but I really wanted to provide this so we have a good understanding of what's really happening. So when we input energy, we're really trying to target the mitochondria, which is kind of the powerhouse aspect of our cells. It's what makes the vast majority of all of our energy. In the middle here, we have a cytochrome C and the cytochrome oxidase. And this is all generally referred to as the cytochrome C complex. And it has the ability to receive light. They have uh, photoreceptors within our cells that can actually receive light and transform it into a form of energy that the cell can use, which is in the form of electrons. And this cascade really results in the production of ATP. ATP is the main kind of energy currency, if you want to think about it that way, that allows cells to use that to perform a number of different tasks. So we're doing all sorts of cellular functions like protein th synthesis, repair of cell walls. We are improving our signaling between cells. And another important function that I think a lot of people don't think about is apoptosis. And what this means is a cellular death that has to occur when the cell is no longer healthy or has been damaged to the point beyond repair. And what happens is if the cell doesn't have enough energy or the surrounding cells don't have enough energy, those cells can, are not able to be cleaned up and removed so that new cells can be you know, created or shared or migrate in, in order to replace those cells. So it's really important not only in repair and getting better tissue, blood flow, all of that, but also in removing waste products and dead cells that no longer need to be there. So this is the main mechanism of how laser is working is it's really producing the ATP to cause all this repair. We also though, with laser, it, it is receptive on a few other sites that are important. So light stimulates nitric oxide, NO, production, nitric oxide, increases blood flow, causes vasodilation. So when your blood vessels enlarge, you can get more blood flow to a certain area. So this is important because blood carries a lot of our nutrients and our antioxidants. It's also that whole blood flow of arteries in and veins and our lymphatic system out is also how we remove waste materials and toxins. And so the laser is really promoting not only this flow and better blood flow to damaged areas, but also formation of new blood vessels, which again is just really important in that healing process and tissue modulation. Another important uh, mechanism that laser works on is by reacting with reactive oxygen species or ROS. This is an important part of inflammatory cascades. And so it really can modulate inflammation and that is a very complex system. So I'm not gonna dive too deeply into it now, but what we end up seeing is that it really decreases that chronic inflammation and inflammatory signals and cascades. Because a lot of times the way inflammation works is if one thing triggers it, it's a whole cascade of effects that really is not stopped unless we send signals to, to terminate that. And so it's really important that we get the proper signaling early on before the whole cascade occurs. And so this mechanism is also really interesting. So recently, uh, in the last several years, the FDA has approved treatment with, um, of toenail fungus with laser. People are like, how does that work? And this is a key to that mechanism is that by creating these oxygen species, it's actually killing the fungus and promoting the immune system and the blood flow in the localized area. So I've used this quite effectively uh, myself clinically, as well as there are many other practices so as well. So hope that's not too gruesome of a photo. This is just a quick one to demonstrate the wound healing aspect of laser. Uh, this is a patient who we saw, we did three treatment sessions after they kind of sliced off a little chunk of their nail and finger. Um, and it really, I think is a great visual because a lot of times when we're doing healing like inside a knee or inside another joint or inside the brain or anything like that, we don't really see what's going on. So. In general, these are the big takeaways of what laser is doing. So it's really modulating inflammation and those cascades. It's really promoting tissue and wound healing. So this is on a very small level, the cellular level, but it's also happening uh, as all those cells work in concert together to create new connective tissue, new layers of skin, uh, new layers of fat and muscle and all of that. It improves blood flow to that localized damaged tissue. 
not only blood flow in, waste materials out, and new formation of blood vessels if required. It modulates the immune system, again, through a lot of different cascades. And then a huge therapeutic outcome that patients commonly experience is decreased pain, and that's really because we've done all the things above. Here are some examples of very commonly uh, common uses for the class four laser. And so maybe some of you also have some of these things going on and can relate to arthritis or back pain, kind of soft tissue damage. We have those interesting, a uh, little more, you know, not following our similar patterns such as toenail fungus. And um, even more recently, it's now been approved to treat chemotherapy induced oral mucositis or when you get sores and other issues in the mouth after chemotherapy. So that's a treatment that we can use as well. And uh, again, we don't yet have approval from FDA to treat Parkinson's disease as well as some other conditions that it's used for, but we are starting to have more and more clinical trials and people's you know, clinical experience, professionals' clinical experience. Okay, so when, of course, we definitely wanna know, all right, so it seems really great. Now, what, what are these potential side effects? What are the contraindications and all of that? So laser um, is fantastic in this realm. So we only have some potential side effects of localized heat or redness. And that's, I've only seen this if, if the laser is, is too hot or too high, we're putting out too much energy. And that's easily remedied in my clinical experience. We just pause it, we drop down the energy output. Um, again, it should be really properly administered, taking into account uh, different pigmentation, history, etc. Um, and occasionally, some people feel, have a localized feeling of soreness. Again, I clinically have only ever seen this once. I Almost everyone who leaves feels lighter, more energized. They're ready to go. They, they have less pain. They have greater mobility, things like that. There are some contra indications, and I've listed them here. I think the one that's really most important and pertinent to the group as we are talking is implanted electrical devices, so pacemakers and the deep brain stimulators, anything with that electrical current. Uh, we don't want to interfere with that at all. Um, but it, we can go over hard metal and some other things that are commonly contraindications for other treatments. So it, again, we have very few side effects, if any, and the list of contraindications is actually fairly small for a therapy. So that was the overview of laser. And we're gonna, after we, we're gonna jump over to thinking about Parkinson's disease for as a systemic disease. And once we have that foundation, then we're gonna go into how we apply laser to Parkinson's disease, what we do, how it works in more detail and specifically to PD. Um, but I do wanna take just a step here because I think, I wanna make sure we're all on the same page in terms of how I think about PD and what kind of research there is in terms of it really being systemically involved. So most commonly people think about PD in the brain and nervous system. We definitely know we have degeneration of neurons, particularly dopaminergic neurons. We also know that we have brain and neuronal inflammation. And when, when I say brain and neuronal inflammation, I mean, yes, absolutely in the structure of the brain and the brain stem and the entire spinal cord, but also thinking about nerves are not one way highways from the brain out. There's a lot of sensory input, biochemical input that's happening hundreds of times every second of every day from the rest of our body and our environment back to our brain. So this inflammation is, it, it travels both directions and can be originating in the brain, but also can be originating in the body and traveling to the brain, which is important. We also have the presence of abnormal alpha-synuclein proteins, and this occurs well, actually throughout the body, which we'll dive into in a moment, but we see it in the spinal cord and of course in the brain. And this is a really important part in terms of the toxicity and what can really cause a lot of damage, neuronal damage long-term in the brain and spinal cord. And we also have a lot of stress. So this whole concept of sympathetic, parasympathetic, in other words, your uh, fight, flight, I'm stressed out, um, I think historically people might say like, a lion is trying to eat me, but I also think of it as you have a work deadline or you have emotional stress at home. I mean, all of this is stress in the body. We also have so much stress that's happening that we're not conscious of. And again, that could be environmental toxins. It can be all sorts of biochemical events that are happening that our body is registering as stress, but we're not aware of. 
and parasympathetic, which is typically the rest, the digest. We are calm. Things are able to operate. Uh, we're, we're not in this acute fight or flight. We're not acutely stressed out because when we're stressed out, a lot of things take the back plate. And some of those things are important detoxification and repair processes that will only happen if we're not in a sympathetic state. So the common symptoms, I really don't need to review those because I think you all, um, the vast majority of people here either live it or they have loved ones who have lived it for a very long time. All I want to say is that remembering that depression and insomnia and even confusion and memory deficits are part of what's also happening as a result of what's going on in the brain and the nervous system, um, in addition to a lot of the muscular skeletal and movement things. Okay, let's talk about PD in the gut. So we briefly touched on the alpha synuclein proteins, and these are misfolded proteins that because they're not folded correctly, uh, their signaling is disrupted and it causes a kind of toxic cascade to a lot of other neurons. Animal models have been demonstrating that the migration occurs, it starts in the gut, and the migration occurs via the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is actually a cranial nerve, what that means is the nerve starts and originates from the brain and it comes down directly into the body. It does not, uh, the, the vast majority of all nerves in our body come out from the spinal cord. They exit at different levels. So our cranial nerves are pretty unique in that they come out of the brain and go directly, they drop into the body and they don't need to bypass through the spine. So this is a very important thing to understand that a lot of these alpha synuclein proteins, the ones that have gone wrong or are misfolded, the, a lot of them, if not all of them, might actually originate in the gut. And that can be due to a lot of different things, inflammation in the gut, altered microbiome, so all of the bacteria and fungi and, and all these little critters that make up a vast majority of actually what is happening in our gut and our gut signaling. Um, there are very healthy gut microbiomes and very unhealthy gut microbiomes. We also see a reduction of short chain fatty acid production. This is really important in inflammation. It definitely ties into the microbiome and also into the amount of toxins that are in our colon specifically. And we see a lot of immune dysfunction. So GALT is a type of gut associated lymphoid tissue that resides in the gut. And we see disruption there as well in PD. So a lot of common symptoms that people with PD experience are constipation, gas and bloating, a lot of upper stomach issues, heartburn, indigestion and burping. We're not absorbing a lot of nutrients. This is in part due to the laxicity of muscle um, actually, and the dopaminergic response happens uh, throughout the body, including all of the muscle that's in our digestive tract. Interestingly, loss of sense of smell is frequently one of the earliest symptoms that people experience. And I also put depression and anxiety here because a lot of that can start in the gut. In fact, we can produce a lot of neurotransmitters in our gut, including dopamine. So the fact that dopamine production does not only occur in the brain, but also second largest area is in the gut. And in some studies, we see even more being produced in the gut than we ever thought before. It's really important to understand how, how that is tied in. There's a little star by constipation or asterisk by constipation. I wanted to highlight that there are a lot of drugs that people are on that something like constipation, gas bloating, slow transit time are actually a side effect, including cinnamon. So, and that's in the you know prescription details um, just as a common side effect. So I do know that in clinical experience, a lot of times we are playing this balance of yes, PD in and of itself can cause constipation. And then also a lot of the drugs um, that we're trying to use to, to treat, we meaning neurologists and patients in the neurologist are trying to treat uh, also can cause the constipation. So it can, there are multiple factors going on here. So the other factors that really increase the risk of PD, but also are promoting a faster progression would be poor heart rate variability. I'm gonna dive into that a little bit more later. Um, but that definitely is related to our stress response. All sorts of GI inflammation, we talked about some of them, um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, allergies, things like that, in addition to dysbiosis, not getting enough exercise, various nutrient deficiencies. So actually like an example of this is lithium deficiency has been shown to uh, increase or increase the progression, faster progression, worse prognosis. 
in Parkinson's disease, which is interesting, as well as uh, in some people, they have an excess iron. Iron is oxidative to this system and causes a lot more damage. So nutrients, there's lots of details, very nuanced, very, we have to take it on an individual basis, but we do have a lot of evidence around there. Depression and loneliness, I want to dive into this a little bit more uh, coming up. Um, I think a really important the next two bullet points are very big and really important. So any kind of disrupted and poor sleep, and specifically that REM cycle, and environmental toxins. So, I mean, we have a lot of different things that fall into this category, but definitely think about um, pesticides, herbicides, and a lot of these heavy metals. Low levels of glutathione. We're going to talk about this a little bit more, but glutathione is the body's natural antioxidant. So it's what we make naturally to deal with all sorts of environmental, biochemical, and neurosignaling stress. And when we have low levels of it, not only is it risk for PD, but it worsens progression. The last three bullet points, so the two in yellow advanced age and male sex, can't really do much about it if you're a 72 year old male um, with a male sex. I'm, I'm, we're not, we're not going to really touch that, but we can touch all the other things. Um, and genetics. This is an interesting one because absolutely there is a genetic predisposition, and importantly, we can modify a lot of how genes are expressed, which is the whole field of epigenetics. And so we'll be talking a little bit about that moving forward. Is actually one of the things that laser can do is in interacting with certain cells that modulate how the cell is expressing certain genes. So let's dive in to that. Let's really look at how we're going to be applying laser and uh, certain other therapies in that functional approach to work on all these things that we just talked about that are part of Parkinson's disease. So let's dive into the brain. When we're applying laser to the brain, we can think about it in several different mechanisms that might be happening. If we are directly stimulating distressed and damaged neurons in the brain, we're really increasing, again, ATP production, which is stimulating repair and expression of protective genes. So we, we talked about this a little bit, and that's part of how the laser is penetrating through a lot of the tissue and is interacting with brain tissue, specifically the neurons that have already been damaged. We also are indirectly, excuse me, indirectly stimulating a lot of the support cells. So neurons are actually pretty picky in the, in the world of cells. They need a lot of support. They need a really kind of perfect environment. They need a lot of help with signaling. And so we have a whole host of immune system cells, stem cell systems that are providing an immense amount of support of delivery of nutri uh, nutrients, taking away waste. We're decreasing um, pro-inflammatory cytokines and recruiting anti-inflammatory ones. Some of these cells, um, if you've ever heard of them, are like glial cells and Schwann cells, all sorts of different cells that have these jobs. So with when we're using laser stimulation, yes, we're, we're stimulating the directly damaged ones, but we're also recruiting a lot of these other cells to provide that support and help these other cells really recover. We are also stimulating other regions in the brain. So besides really focusing on that midbrain aspect or the basal ganglia or this um, you know, brainstem, we're, we're also looking at other centers such as the motor cortex. And so we're actually affecting neuronal pathways between you know, the neural cortex and all the other tracks that it leads to. And that's causing improvements in movements. But we also see it, you know, clinically, I see a lot of people who have an improvement, for example, in memory and word recall. And we're hitting different areas that are affecting word processing and memory, such as Wernicke's or Broca's areas as well. So all these other regions can also be more optimized and the pathways improved, uh, regardless of how we're also affecting those more directly influenced cells. I also want to highlight here that we are, of course, throughout our body, we have blood vessels, lymphatic tissue, immune cells that are everywhere. They're, they're all over the place and very, very small and sometimes large. And so we are always hitting those structures as well. In addition, when we talk about lasering, because we have this understanding now that Parkinson's disease, these misfolded proteins, the inflammation, the microbiome, there's so many other aspects that are going on. So we really need to treat those other areas as well. And so in the approach with laser, not only are lasering the brain, we're also lasering the whole spinal cord. 
along the back and we're lasering the gut. So we're really decreasing cellular toxicity from those abnormal folding alpha synuclein proteins. So we're trying to get them potentially where they're starting in the gut and then over the whole tract up the spinal cord and into the brain. An interesting study showed that laser to the abdomen is actually increasing beneficial bacteria. So an example is the bifidobacteria. Uh, and that's really important because not only does it decrease disease promoting bacteria, but it's increasing the beneficial ones that are actually protective to your entire system and your nervous system, yes, in your brain, um, but it also is protective to a lot of other diseases. We are also decreasing inflammation in, again, blood vessels, lymphatic tissue, and immunological cells that are support cells and also are major players in these cascades that we're talking about. So typical clinical outcomes you see, specifically when we're talking about PD. And I'm gonna talk through a little bit of the timeline after this, but we really see improved mood. That's one of the biggest things. A lot of people, I mean, really, even after one or two sessions have, they feel lighter, they feel happier. It's just a little bit easier to, you know, calm that anxiety or depression, things like that. Clearer thoughts, better word recall, even improved memory over time improved digestion. So the biggest thing that we see is decreased constipation because that's really one of the most common symptoms, but also decreased gas and bloating, things like that. Improved sleep. So not only the duration, so just getting better sleep, but also the quality. So really waking up feeling well. And in some, in certain cases, if we're able to measure REM, we see improvements there as well. And of course, by improving sleep, we're causing a whole cascade of improvements in tissue repair and wound healing and detoxification, all of that stuff that happens in your sleep. Importantly, when we are sleeping, the lymphatic system that resides in our brain and is frequently called glymphatic, the glial cells that are really responsible for cleaning out, can really take away toxins, waste products, things like that out of the brain. And that really predominantly occurs when we sleep. So getting that quality sleep is really, really important as well. We also say improved coordination and balance and decreased pain. Little asterisk here because it really depends on where we're treating. So if we're treating over the spine, most people who have neck pain or back pain also get a benefit of decreasing the pain there, for an example. Um, so when we're talking about individuals, it does really depend on, for example, how long has this person had PD? So are we talking 30 years? Are we talking 10 years? Are we talking five years? Definitely if you know someone is further along in the progression, it does take more treatments and more time to reach some of the same outcomes that other people might experience if perhaps they've only had PD for five or 10 years. And of course, the more sessions that we do, so if we're treating two to three times a week, that will progress much quicker than if we're treating, you know, once every week or once every couple of weeks. Um, An individual in terms of the order, this order is not chronological. It completely depends on the individual. Again, the, the thing I see the most quickly typically is that improved mood and lightness and clearer thoughts, but it really depends on the individual. So let's look at a few of the research studies here. So this is looking at, I have a couple different animal and human models. So we're exploring the use of transcranial photobiomodulation or PBM therapy. And this is a pretty long study. It's really diving into a lot of different things. But what we see is that lasers is providing a neuroprotective disease modifying effect. And this is really, relevant because in PD, we do not have very many, if any, drug and surgical therapies that are modifying disease in a really positive, improving way. And what I mean specifically by that is typically people are told and what we typically see is that things will be kind of stable or get worse. And that's kind of the only option. We don't really see people getting better in a lot of ways. So this is a evidence from these studies cited here, and I do have a reference at the very end if you want to dive into any of those more, that it, we're really showing neuroprotective effect and that the it's not only slowing certain disease progression, but we're actually improving. 
This is a study that is talking really about that alpha synuclein protein that we discussed. And this is looking at it in mice specifically and how it discusses the migration, but really importantly, how the PBM, PMB, photobiomodulation therapy treatment, um, mitigates dopaminergic loss. In other words, it helps improve the cells functioning so that they're not losing as much dopamine production because that's part of what the um, alpha synuclein protein is causing in these, in these models um, within the substantia micro. I did want to put this that this is a this is a very new field and there's a lot happening. So there's several upcoming trials. This is an excerpt. Now this trial, my understanding is that it was paused, um, hopefully paused, hopefully not not completely discontinued due to COVID and all of the challenges in doing clinical trials over the last year and a half or so. Um, but this is looking at a, a helmet that one would wear and then it's emitting the laser, the light therapy, which is pretty exciting. So um, we're seeing trials out of France and Australia. And this one I think might be, we're, we're, I'm not sure yet, so I won't say anything more about it, but I do think that in the coming years, I really hope to have more and more clinical trials and getting larger sample groups. A lot of the trials right now are on, you know, 20, 25, maybe 40 people uh, at most. So let's jump into a few of the other things that we can really consider in Parkinson's disease when we're trying to target some of those other pathways. So we definitely, in addition to laser improving sleep, we can also work on REM dysfunction. Um, and something that's really important, so we talked about how a lot of detoxification occurs. Also, the majority of glutathione production occurs at night during those deep REM cycles. So glutathione, again, is that antioxidant that we produce naturally and super, super important in the brain. So there are lots of different tools that we can use, but getting optimal sleep is very, very important. It should definitely be a priority. We talk about nutrients and diet, so definitely optimizing antioxidants anytime you put anything in your mouth, getting as many antioxidants as you can, addressing all those GI disorders. And I mean, those could be webinars each on each topic, but there's so much there that if there's any kind of gastrointestinal inflammation, leaky gut, not, not optimally uh, functioning tissue and blood for, blood supply as well as the nerve signals, we definitely have to address that. A couple of big things, um, Orex score foods, I like a lot because it's a score on how oxidizing and, and free radical quenching foods are. So one of my favorite foods for that reason are barberries, they're also called lingonberries. They're very high in antioxidants, more than blueberries and goji berries and they score really well in the ORX score. Um, a lot of herbs and spices do as well. So there are things that we can do, isolated compounds, but also you can get a really nice dose of all of these different antioxidant rich foods daily. And then fiber, an average American is eating maybe 10 to 15 grams a day. I work with people definitely on increasing fiber so that we're improving that short chain fatty acid production that we talked about. We're feeding a really healthy gut microbiome and we're decreasing inflammation and really importantly, improving constipation. And no, supplemental fiber is not the same as fiber from food. So they, they definitely do not have the same clinical and science outcomes, and there's a lot of research on that as well. Um, and then an area I encourage everyone to do is getting that daily exercise and movement and really causing challenge to our brain. And I know you all have a lot of presentations, I imagine, and information on this, but just reminding ourselves that anytime we challenge the brain, to think, and not necessarily in the way that you might say, like oh, I'm doing a crossword, but to challenge it in coordination and balance and cross-body movement, it, it sends signals to stimulate new neuronal pathways and new cells to be formed. And that's definitely what we want to be doing. A few other things to highlight here in terms of this really holistic approach and treating everything that's going on. Um, definitely stress management. We're going to dive into heart rate variability in the next slide. A concept, there are a couple of concepts on this slide, both are Japanese that I really like, and there's also just really budding research on both of them to support what we kind of know historically. So Shinrin Yoku is forest bathing or being exposed to nature for a prolonged period of time. So we're saying like at least about 30 minutes, roughly speaking. And this has been shown to really regulate a lot of different stress signals that impact 
blood pressure, neurons, your immune system, cholesterol levels, et cetera. And I know in a beautiful state like Colorado, a lot of us can really enjoy being outside um, and spending time in nature, really surrounded by it in all of your senses can have a really profound impact on your health. And it's great if you can get out, you know, one day on the weekend, and it's even better if you can get that, you know, train for about like 30 minute dose kind of daily is what a lot of research is showing us. Um, so when we looked at risk for PD progression, we had depression and isolation or loneliness was on that slide because we have evidence that it, you have worse progression. Now I know this past, especially this past year and a half has been particularly challenging, but it is challenging in general for, for a number of reasons, but having community and positive relationships um, and ikigai, which is a, the concept of having purpose in your life, having something that helps you wake up in the morning and get going is really important and helps to mitigate a lot of the symptoms of depression and isolation and loneliness. And so it's really good for absolutely anybody and especially people with PD, like this is a very, very important thing to address and to be honest with oneself and honest with others about um, and really dive into. And finally, we've talked a lot about this. Again, this is a very, very exhaustive topic. There's so much to go into here, but we really want to reduce toxins, not only things that are being input into the body, but also understanding past exposures and what you might be already carrying and how if there is a way to safely and effectively mobilize some of those out of the system. So this is brief concept on heart rate variability. And again, it's a measurement of how well your body is dealing with stress. So on the bottom, the red kind of jagged up and down lines is your heart rate. And what I want you to look at is how the, the distance between each of the tall peaks. So when we look at the bottom um, x-axis, it has seconds. So between roughly 11 and 14 seconds, we're seeing that those heart rates or heartbeats are much closer together. And then we get, get to around 16 seconds, we see that they are further apart. And then we look up at the blue line above it, and that's marking your breath. So when you inhale and you're going up the curve, your heart rate increases. And then when you exhale, your heart rate is decreasing. And that's a natural variance that occurs in a regulated, happy, healthy stress system. So when you inhale, if you think about when you get scared, everyone goes and you take a breath in and you tense up and that's normal. And then if you need to relax, you like Oh, like big breath out, it helps relax your body. And so this is a way that by regulating your breathing, you can actually re-educate your heart rate and the signals it's sending to your nervous system and the inflammation that exists in your nervous system to calm down and to re-regulate. And it's also a marker for longevity. It's a marker for improved at, you know, outcomes in cardiovascular disease. There's a lot of research that's been done and continues to be done uh, in this area, but this is something that I definitely find to be really valuable for people with PD and in general. Okay, so and these are also experts in botanical medicine, really understanding interactions, contraindications, and we have a variety of mechanisms of action that are really helpful in the gut-brain barrier. So I pulled a couple studies. This one is on Macuna perens, which is a legume family plant. And this was looking at a blind randomized controlled trial in Parkinson's disease. And they were comparing the extract of this plant to a combination of levodopa and dopa decarboxylase inhibitor. And what was really interesting are the results where it shows both when compared, so Makuna versus the drug combo, um, Makuna showed similar motor response with fewer dyskinesias and adverse effects. And it induced greater motor improvement at 90 and 180 minutes of administration with longer on durations. And so clinically what we see from this trial is that the high doses were similar to levodopa alone um, with a more favorable tolerability profile. And that's something that we commonly see that 
a lot of herbs, and this is not across the board, but a lot of urban herb extracts actually have more favorable adverse uh, effects or reactions. Here's another example. A lavender oil preparation, Selexin, was compared with paroxetine and the placebo. Um, paroxetine is a drug that is commonly used to treat generalized anxiety disorder. So with the lavender oil, we saw that not only did we see a reduction in anxiety symptoms, we also had a pronounced antidepressant effect and improved general mental health and quality of life standards with comparable rates to placebo in terms of adverse reactions and lower adverse reactions than the active control paroxetine, which is the drug. So again, seeing not only efficacy, but a decrease in a lot of our adverse reactions. And again, anxiety and depression um, is such an important part of PD as well as a lot of other diseases. We also can really use potent food and herb extracts. A lot of times combinations can be more effective. We're really focusing on this epigenetic pathway. So we talked a little bit about how the laser can really impact how cells repair themselves and regulate genetic um, expression essentially of different receptors. And we can also modify uh, different pathways that affect again, genetic expression, including methylation pathways, the ROS, which we talked about, glutathione we talked about, transsulfuration, which is another pathway. Um, so again, here's a study that is looking at the combination of omega-3 fatty acids with vitamin E, and this is in people with Parkinson's disease, double-blind placebo-controlled trial. And so not only did it significantly improve the UPDRS, which is the universal Parkinson's disease, so a scoring system. We also saw a decrease in high sensitivity C-reactive protein. That is an inflammatory marker um, that is high sensitivity, meaning it's able to pick it up really well, that inflammation. It increased total antioxidant capacity, and we see an increase in glutathione concentrations. And so it had really, you know, favorable effects, again, on something that we're really, really interested in, which is the expression of Parkinson's disease, but also all these other systemic markers of inflammation. And this one is uh, looking at probiotics in a Parkinson you know, PD patients in a randomized double-blind controlled trial. So administration of certain probiotics also we're seeing similar outcomes. So it's really reducing that HSCRP, which is that inflammatory marker, better glutathione. We're also seeing a reduction in insulin levels and insulin resistance, which is really important in managing blood sugar and inflammation in the body. And lastly, we really work, uh, you know, when we're working with people as, as naturopathic doctors or in a functional medicine setting, really wanting to focus on what is most important to that individual, really regulating breath and, and heart rate and talking about, you know, why, why are we here? What are we really after? Is it to get into are we, are we wanting to do that dream trip and you wanna be mobile and healthy for it? Is it to see grandchild graduate? There, there are lots of reasons, but these are kind of the why, the why we get up every day and what helps us keep going. So let's dive in the last couple of minutes here, we'll dive into a case study and then we'll definitely get to questions. So I just wanted to share a case study on a 78 year old male and he had Parkinson's disease for, oh, we jumped slides here. There we go. Um, for 10 years and had main symptoms of impaired balance, depression, constipation, gas and burping, and resting tremor. We also see elevated blood pressure, cholesterol, and prediabetes. Pre uh, currently retired, but he was a teacher. Did grow up on a dairy farm. And anytime I hear this, I'm definitely asking the questions, what were you doing on the dairy farm? What were you exposed to? And in this case, it was a lot of pesticides, herbicides, um, just a lot of toxins in the whole large scale farm production. Um, at the time of our initial visit, it was on carbidopa, levodopa, 25, 50, 100, seven times a day. Um, so our treatment, I, I did kind of bullet points here because there's so much that we did, but we definitely started with a laser. We were doing twice weekly for 30 minute sessions each. We jumped into a GI protocol to really address the dysbiosis first and then did a whole heal the gut lining. Um, we really shifted his diet. So he started to eat vegetables and fruits, legumes, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. We did low mercury fish twice weekly, and he stopped eating meat, dairy, processed foods, also stopped alcohol consumption. 
We also did antioxidant supplements with nutrient replacements as needed for him specifically. And we worked on stress reduction. So he was really brave. He started Tai Chi for the first time with his breathing exercises and also increased daily walks. We also, um, it wasn't this first visit, but after about three months, we started a gentle sauna therapy to increase, increase sweating and and a gentle safe detoxification. And he also had always wanted to join um, the community church to volunteer, but had been really nervous because of having PD, but he was really brave and stepped into that and, and became more active in the community. So we saw significant improvements with his bowel movements. So instead of going three times a week, he's going daily. He had a lot of mental fog and fatigue resolved had improvements in his coordination, balance, and mobility. He was actually, he worked with his neurologist closely during this time and was able to, um, over after that six month period, started the reduction and they decided to reduce it to about four times a day, um, his, his cinema. And then um, his energy, he just said, has been better than it has been um, in the last 15 years. And his, his blood pressure actually just normalized. We weren't specifically targeting that, but that was just one of the great side effects. So I will stop talking now so that we have a little bit of time for questions. Here's my information. If any of you want to get in touch or have additional follow-ups, I'm always happy to hear from everyone. I did put some of the, the references. If there's anything that you know, again, you want to dive into more deeply, please let me know. And then I did put a few resources here as well. The Light Force Medical is the company that produces the laser that I use, as well as other people who use it. And then I did put a little bit of information here if you're interested in, in investigating a little bit more about what naturopathic doctors are or anything like that. All right, thank you so much. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer and discuss. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Wadler. That was just so much great information. And we do get a ton of questions, especially on nutrition and diet. So I think you probably answered quite a few of those today as okay. well. Um, there are two ways to ask questions right now. Um, so there is a question on, on your dashboard to the right. There's a questions tab and you can type your question in there. The other way to do it is to click on the hand. There's a raised hand and you can click on that hand and hopefully I will be able to unmute you. So <laughs> we'll, we'll give that one a shot as well. So while we're waiting for some people to type in some questions, um, I did get one from Nancy. And I know that one of your, um, your contraindications was a pacemaker. So if you have a pacemaker, is this not a reasonable treatment um, or is this something that you can or cannot do with a pacemaker, I guess is the question. And we're talking specifically about the laser as a treatment. Correct. Um, yeah. pacemaker. So yes, so laser is contraindicated when you have a pacemaker to interfere with the electrical current. And so I typically, the only areas that are I feel comfortable with typically would be something on the legs, like if your foot had an injury and I treated your foot because that's far enough away that it doesn't disrupt with any of the signaling. Um, I think it would be an individualized basis whether we could treat the brain or not. We definitely could not treat kind of, you know, the torso. We can't treat the the abdomen or the back, the spine with a pacemaker. So most likely not. Um, to answer the question, unfortunately, just for the okay. safety of the patient, yeah. Sure, that, that's good to know. Um, and then we have a question, let's see, uh, Kirk, I'm gonna unmute you and you can ask your question. Let's see. Okay, see if that works. So Kirk, you can unmute, you need to unmute yourself and then you should be able to ask the question. Okay, there can we you hear go. me now? We can. I think my question is related to the last one because I've had DBS and I take it that that would uh, uh, make it uh, difficult for me to benefit from this. Is that right? If you have an active, if you have a, uh, you know, machine or whatever, it, however you want to call it. If you have that implant in your brain actively now, no, I cannot treat, you know, 
the brain. However, if you've had it in the past and you no longer have anything residing in your brain, then it would not be a contraindication. Mm. Okay. No, yeah, I have a neurostimulator that's on all the time, so. Okay, yeah, so that, that's a, that would not be safe because you already have that electrical current in your body. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thanks, Kirk. Um, all right, so we've got quite a few questions here. Um, do you participate in insurance or is this a self-pay? Okay, yes, yeah, so this is self-pay. In the state of Colorado, naturopathic doctors are not covered in almost any insurance model. And so, unfortunately, I, up in the state of Washington where I was trained, I was definitely used to using that model of insurance, but um, in the state of Colorado, unfortunately not. I do have a few different uh, uh, payment options, which we can always go into, and they're also on my website, but um, unfortunately not at this time. Um, some, a lot of people though are able to use HSA or FSA cards if people have those. Okay, great. Um, and then I know Karen is looking for your contact info again, and Karen, we will make sure to send out those links and um, resources and contact info that Dr. Wildler shared at the end. Um, so we'll send that out to everybody who attended the seminar. Um, let's, and another question, please share the name of the ND in Washington State who evaluates and treats PD. Was that in? There, there are several. Um, the person I think maybe you're referring to is Dr. Laura Mishley. Um, Lori Mishley, she's the one who received the NIH grant and she's, I believe, an ND MPH and uh, has lots of published work, things like that. Yeah, and, and Dr. Mishley has actually um, presented at our E3 conference and she is amazing. So, and I know she's got a great website as well that's just full of information. Uh, let's um, question from Margaret To decrease dairy, would you recommend the best non dairy milk? I think that that really depends on the individual and what we're going for. So like just to put out an example, are we looking to increase protein intake? And that will depend on which type of non-dairy milk you're looking for. Um, or, you know, coconut milk, for example, is a pretty common one, but it also is high in saturated fat. So for someone who has problems with that, I wouldn't recommend coconut milk and I would recommend something else. Also, if we're looking at modulating uh, estrogen receptors, then we may or may not recommend soy. So I don't have a blanket statement that this is the milk for everybody. It, it really depends on what else is going on for that person. Um, but thankfully nowadays we have so many different options when it comes to dairy alternatives and meat alternatives and just a lot of all of those things. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and then let's see, another question from Gary, is laser therapy effective in treating PD related joint pain? Uh, yes, it, the short answer is yes. We definitely have both clinical trials and, and clinical experience. Um, joint pain is one of the most common things that I see. And the way I've structured, at least I've structured, now this is depends on many different providers do different things, but I've structured it so that I'm spending at least 30 minutes total on laser. And so between the brain, the spinal cord, and the gut, that usually takes about 20 to 25 minutes. And then we usually round out the time by treating knee pain, arthritis in the hands, muscle pain, muscle spasms, all, all of those other kind of things can also be addressed. Great. Um, and then we've got a question about Greek yogurt. And I, I always think that's a good, that we get that question a lot is should we be eating Greek yogurt? Um, but I'm gonna extend that to even say, what about other probiotics that might be good for people to take? Yeah, so great question. So. Probiotics, what a world that whole whole world is. Um, in terms of, for mo I'm gonna say, again, there are certain individuals where I don't make this recommendation, but I would say for most people, dairy worsens progression of PD. And Dr. Mishley's work and evidence over the years has is where I'm getting that information from. And so in general, I don't, that's not my go-to for sources of probiotics. There are, in certain people, when we don't have a good foundation in the gut. So I kind of think of it as like a lot of the bacteria are actually like the plants that are growing and we need soil or a foundational aspect that allows those bacteria to grow. And so a lot of times that takes 
in the form of spores. So sometimes we need to get a, a good spore layer before, and then we add on good probiotics in the form of capsules. But I really like food sources of probiotics. And some of my favorites traditionally are gonna be sauerkraut, kimchi, um, even things like kombucha or other things that people are naturally fermenting that don't have the dairy component be just because dairy can be so aggravating for a lot of people, especially with PD and constipating actually too. So I guess the question in answering for Greek yogurt in general, that's not my recommendation. I do want to put the caveat that I've worked with several people with PD who have really struggled to keep on weight and that's a whole different um I, i'm not making dietary restriction recommendations to anyone who's struggling with weight and that comes you know that it's much more important than um when we're talking about someone who has a potentially healthy weight or even wants to lose weight that's a really different uh, category if anyone is struggling with significant weight loss or keeping anything on i, I don't recommend dietary restrictions as the first line treatment at all Okay, thank you. And and I think that's, uh, you know, I like to say everyone with, or I'm sure everyone likes to say this, everyone with PD is on their own journey. It sounds like with your treatment plan, everyone has a very different treatment plan as well. Absolutely, it's true. And then that's why, so when I say like we're treating the gut, that looks super different depending on who it is, what their exposures are, what's going on in their disease processes and what else is going on in the body because it's rare that someone only has PD and absolutely nothing else is going on in their in their body, so. Yeah. Okay. All right. And that brings us to the end of our time and the end of our questions. So that was perfect timing. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Wilder, for your time today. And again, I just want to remind everybody that you will be getting this recording. You will also be getting a survey. So please fill out those surveys and return them to us. Um, that is how we get information on other education topics that you might be interested in seeing. So I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their Thursday afternoon. And thanks again, Dr. Wilder. Have a great day. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you.